Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. We're um, going to discuss a very, very important uh, medical legal case, uh, perhaps one of the most important in recent times, uh, particularly for our profession. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this, uh, an important aspect of Critical Care Forum. And, uh, um, I, on behalf of myself, Brian Kavanagh, and Peter Cox, my colleague. Peter is uh, Chief of uh, Pediatric uh, Critical Care Medicine at the Hospital of Sick Children and a full Professor of Anesthesia. The uh, issue is important. It concerns uh, many decisions and a fair bit of uncertainty. And the afternoon will be structured as follows. We'll have a presentation of the case. We'll have a presentation of the argument. We'll have a presentation of the judgment, uh, the clinician's response to that, and then the legal response to the clinician's response. And then we'll have a quite a bit of time for questions. We would ask you, <clears throat> in a non-draconian way, although we will be draconian, uh, we would ask you to, to concentrate on being concise with your questions. Please think about your questions. Please identify yourself in question time and be very, very concise because a lot of people will have questions. Um, we are joined here by Erica Barron, who was not on the early version of the program. Erica is a partner with McCarthy Tetro, and uh, she and Andrew McCutcheon, who's an associate with the same firm, both worked on this case, the Rizzuli case. Please silence your cell phones, and uh, please enjoy the, uh, this important uh, um, session. Uh, Peter will introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Brian. So the, the first part of um, how we're going to run this afternoon is actually setting the stage. And, and to do that, it was very important that we took someone who was not involved, that was able to present the case objectively, and that is uh, Stephen Lipinski, who is a professor of medicine and ch chief of critical care at Mount Sinai. So, Stephen, over to you. Right, thanks. So. I've got five minutes, and my role, I think, is twofold. One is to present the case for people. We've got a lot of visitors from outside the country who may not be aware of the case. And for any intensivists who've been living in a cave for the past two years, they need to know about it. And also to let our legal people know how an average intensivist in the same city has interpreted the story through what I've heard from the media and read about the legal proceedings. So. Uh, as I understand it, Mr. Rizzulli was a roughly 59-year-old, or those ages hard to determine from the media, who underwent neurosurgery in October 2010 for a benign brain tumor. And this was followed by post-operative complications, including a meningitis, ventriculitis, and a cardiac arrest, which resulted in a persistent vegetative state. Uh, he had a number of independent neurological assessments and went on to be ventilated via tracheostomy and fed via G-tube. There was some controversy over his neurological function. He seemed to improve. Uh, the media had photographs of him doing things. And the diagnosis was apparently changed to a minimally conscious state in about January 2012. And the physicians at Sunnybrook sought to withdraw life support as they felt there was no realistic likelihood of recovery. Uh, the first leg legal issue came up uh, in the Ontario Superior Court of Justice, March 2011, where the patient's wife was granted an res order restraining the physicians from withdrawing life support and directing the challenge uh, them to go to the Consent and Capacity Board. Physicians apparently argued that consent was not required to withdraw a futile treatment. This went to the Ontario um, Court of Appeal, uh, who upheld the decision stating that the withdrawal of life support uh, was linked with the end-of-life palliative care as a package and as such required consent. And then the most recent uh, occurrence was uh, over the summer uh, with a ruling in October 2013 where the Supreme Court of Canada upheld the Ontario Court of Appeals judgment. And this is just what I got from the um, uh, from the ruling, which we'll get a lot more detail, but they said that the Healthcare Consent Act sets, sets out clear rules that re uh, regarding requirement for consent prior to treatment, who consents for the incapable patient, and the fact that there is the uh, Consent and Capacity Board for disputes, uh, that withdrawal of life support is a treatment requiring consent, and there was a statement regarding the personal ethics and conflicts of physicians looking after patients like this, that such tensions are inherent to medical practice. And so this leaves us with uh, a number of questions which we plan to answer today. Thank you.
I'd like to call on Andrew McCutcheon. Andrew is an associate with uh, McCarthy Tetro, uh, well known to many of us in the city and the country. Uh, all very good reasons, of course. <clears throat> uh, Andrew is a, um, a, a, a prize-winning graduate in, in law. Uh, he's uh, in, involved in uh, litigation and uh, particularly in the health uh, law group at McCarthy Tetro. And he's going to present uh, two elements uh, right now. First is the argument presented. He'll take about 15 minutes, and then he will just spend the next 15 minutes approximately uh, describing and analyzing the Supreme Court's decision and comments. Andrew. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I must say when the Supreme Court of Canada granted leave to appeal in this case, I was very excited uh, because I thought that this was going to be the decision that would bring clarity as to what a doctor's obligations are when a dispute arises uh, in the end of life context. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, this is, uh, as you will see, uh, a very narrow decision, and uh, in particular, uh, really only directly applicable to uh, those of you who are practicing in the province of Ontario. Uh, I'm going to start out by setting out the position that we took uh, uh, on behalf of the doctors, uh, summarize the arguments that we presented in support of that position, and then I'll take you through a summary uh, of the decision itself. The doctor's position on the appeal was that the only criteria uh, that can be used to determine whether a, a life-sustaining treatment should be withdrawn or withheld is whether the standard of care requires that treatment uh, to be offered to the patient. Uh, and the key word in that sentence is requires, uh, because as you know, uh, differences of opinion can arise between doctors as to what treatments a patient should receive. I'm sure that some of you have had patients uh, to whom you are prepared to offer mechanical ventilation or other life support therapies, and I'm sure that some of your colleagues uh, disagree and wouldn't offer uh, those treatments to those patients. That doesn't necessarily mean that one of the two doctors is wrong. The standard of care recognizes that there can be this disagreement, and we say it's only in cases where the standard of care requires a treatment to be offered to the patient that uh, the treatment must be offered. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, you might imagine a patient who undergoes abdominal surgery. Uh, the patient has sleep apnea and develops a respiratory arrest after the surgery. My, my thinking is that every critical care doctor would offer mechanical ventilation to that patient to stabilize the patient uh, so that she can recover uh, from this respiratory uh, depression and then be eventually be discharged uh, home and live a normal, a normal life. In a case like that, uh, the standard of care likely requires that the patient be offered me uh, mechanical ventilation and it should be offered. In support of that position, uh, we raised a number of arguments. The court grouped them into three uh, headlines in the decision. The first argument was that Ontario's Health Care Consent Act simply codifies the common law. Um, the Health Care Consent Act is a statute passed by the Ontario legislature which says, among other things, that a doctor must obtain consent before treating a patient. And those of you from outside of Ontario where you don't have a statute are saying, uh, I don't need a statute, that's how I've been practicing uh, all along. Uh, and in fact, that's because uh, there is a common law requirement. That's a requirement that's been developed through case law, uh, prior judicial decisions. So our position was that the Ontario legislature simply uh, took all of those decisions, summarized them, and, and codified them in this statutory instrument. The nice thing about the common law is that it actually accords with the way that doctors practice medicine. As you know, doctors propose treatment, uh, various treatment options, and then patients either give or refuse consent uh, to those treatments that are presented. So with a patient who suffers from cancer, you might imagine uh, that a doctor could offer some combination of surgery, uh, radiation, or chemotherapy to treat that. The patient has the right to give or refuse to consent to any of those treatment options that are proposed by the doctor. What the patient may not do is say, thank you very much, doctor, but I would like a fourth treatment option. I'd like you to prescribe me uh, high doses of vitamins and, and manage my cancer that way. The patient can't pick and choose a treatment that a doctor is not prepared to provide. 
And the same is true, uh, we said, when a treatment is discontinued. So with that same patient with cancer, you might imagine uh, that they are, are scheduled to receive eight courses of chemotherapy. If after the fifth cycle, it becomes apparent that chemotherapy is not being effective in managing the patient's disease, the doctor is not required to carry on with cycles six, seven, and eight, because to do that would just expose the patient to the harms associated with chemotherapy without providing any medical benefit. And our argument was that it's exactly the same, uh, the, exactly the same thing happens when a doctor is asked to continue a life-sustaining therapy that no longer offers a medical benefit to the patient. And there was good authority for that proposition. Uh, there have been prior decisions of courts in Manitoba, British Columbia, Alberta, uh, and also in the Commonwealth, England, uh, South Africa, and New Zealand that support that proposition. And essentially what they say is that a doctor's obligation is to act in the best interests of his or her patient. And where a treatment offers no medical benefit, the doctor isn't required uh, to offer it or to continue it in a patient. And our argument was that that same rule should apply in Ontario and that the Healthcare Consent Act wasn't meant to change that rule. The second argument that we advanced was essentially a statutory interpretation argument. So this was just a, a reading of the statute and us saying uh, to the court, here's what the statute means. And it turned on the definition of treatment in the Act. The Act defines treatment as anything that is done, so that's the first part, anything that is done for a therapeutic, preventative, palliative, diagnostic, cosmetic, or other health-related purpose. We argued that when a doctor proposes to withdraw a treatment because it doesn't, offer any more it doesn't offer any medical benefit, that treatment no longer serves a health-related purpose. So it doesn't fall within that definition of treatment as it's set out in the Act. Uh, and because it's not a treatment, we argued that doctors aren't required to obtain consent before withdrawing that treatment. The third argument, uh, and, and this was advanced quite forcefully uh, by the Critical Care Society at the appeal, uh, was that forcing doctors to continue treatment in these difficult cases uh, puts them in a position where they must breach their own professional ethics. And that argument, of course, is based uh, on what we all know happens to patients in these end-of-life cases. Uh, all of these uh, aggressive interventions are being administered to them, um, and they don't offer a, a medical benefit. So the only thing that we are doing is hurting the patient. And, and for that reason, there are cases uh, where an order compelling a doctor to administer a particular treatment against their, their better judgment uh, puts them in conflict with their own professional ethics. And this is something uh, that I know uh, doctors feel quite strongly about. Uh, I, I recall, uh, you know, back to, the, to 2008 in Manitoba where a number of intensivists uh, involved in the Golub Chuck case uh, actually resigned from their positions in the ICU uh, rather than be ordered to uh, carry on treatments that they thought uh, were harmful and offered no benefit to the patient. So those are the arguments that we advanced uh, before the court. And the majority of the court unfortunately rejected our arguments. Uh, the essence of the decision is that doctors in Ontario must obtain consent before withdrawing a life-sustaining treatment such as mechanical ventilation. And the decision is, is really a narrow exercise in interpreting that Ontario statute that I, I spoke about earlier. Uh, and pausing there, what that means is that it's not uh, of particular guidance to those of you who practice outside of Ontario. Uh, there are a few provinces that have statutes uh, that are similar to the Healthcare Consent Act uh, that use similar language, uh, British Columbia, Prince Edward Island, uh, and Yukon. Um, this case may be more relevant for you, but we don't know. It'll have to be determined uh, by the courts of those provinces. The first decision that the court, or the first finding that the court made was that life support is a treatment even in circumstances where it doesn't provide a medical benefit to the patient. So they said that there's a difference between a treatment that serves a health-related purpose and a treatment that offers medical benefit to the patient. 
So in Mr. Rizzulli's case, even if mechanical ventilation wasn't offering him a medical benefit, it was serving a health-related purpose. It kept him alive. The court also decided that including life support in, in uh, the definition of treatment was supported by the purposes of the Health Care Consent Act, uh, which was intended to create consistent rules for consent to medical treatment uh, and to improve, uh, to protect patient autonomy uh, when decisions are made about health care. But the court went further than that, and it actually said that the withdrawal of life support is also a treatment, as that term is defined in the Health Care Consent Act. And you'll recall earlier on I told you the definition of treatment is essentially anything that is done for, a health, for one of these various purposes uh, or any other health-related purpose. And what the court said was that the withdrawal of life support involves a series of acts which are performed for a health-related purpose. And that's the, uh, the ending of the suffering and the indignity that goes along with uh, the continuation of life support. So for that reason, the court said, it falls within the definition of treatment, and doctors, you must obtain consent uh, before withdrawing life support. The court was careful to restrict the scope of its decision so it doesn't apply uh, to other medical treatments. So for example, the chemotherapy example that I raised with you earlier, that was something that we argued uh, before the court, and it was obviously something that concerned the court. Uh, because the court was careful to say that it doesn't necessarily apply uh, to all forms of treatment or the withdrawal of all forms of treatment. Unfortunately, the court hasn't set out a framework uh, or any rules that allow us to distinguish before, between uh, those treatments where withdrawal uh, requires consent and those treatments where withdrawal doesn't require consent. So that's one of the big uh, unanswered questions uh, from this decision. And then finally, the court turned uh, to deal with the issue of ethical considerations. Uh, and the court was essentially sympathetic, but said, Doctor, that, doctors, that's always uh, the way that informed consent has been. In the 1950s, uh, doctors believed that it was harmful to advise patients of the risk of a procedure. We don't want to scare patients away uh, from treatments that could save their life by telling them about all these terrible things that might happen to them. And of course, that's a, a very foreign idea uh, today in 2013. Um, similarly, there have been cases where doctors have felt compelled to administer blood transfusions to patients uh, whose religious beliefs forbid them from receiving blood products. And the court essentially said, doctors, you, you got over it before and you'll get over it again. And as I said to you at the outset, this decision does focus squarely on an interpretation of the Ontario statute, uh, but they do make a few throwaway comments about the common law that will no doubt be of assistance to courts in provinces outside of Ontario. And in particular, there is um, a heavy discussion of the law of battery. So the court is very motivated by the fact that withdrawal of care uh, involves interference with a patient's body. Uh, and we expect that that will play some role in future decisions, although we won't be able to say uh, how much because it's sort of a throwaway decision uh, in a decision where the court says uh, at the very beginning, we don't intend for this to apply uh, outside of an interpretation of the uh, Ontario Healthcare Consent Act. Um, so that's a, that's, those are my comments regarding the, uh, the summary of the decision, and uh, now I expect we'll, we'll be hearing from Dr. Baker. Um, thanks very much, Andrew, and as you are well aware, when the court made that finding, it was met with an audible gasp in the medical community. So what Andrew Baker has done is he's surveyed a number of his colleagues and um, we'll present their responses. Andrew is a professor of anesthesia and head of neurocritical care and critical care at St. Mike's. So, Andrew. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, yes, Peter, that's right. I, I do want to acknowledge my colleagues who um, essentially give me their opinions, and I've tried to put it together in, in an amalgamated opinion. 
of a sort of a clinician's perspective on what we heard. And we specifically, or I specifically, have tried not to interpret things uh, with, a, with a legal sort of mind, which I don't have, of course. But this, so this is a clinician's perspective. My comments are divided into four categories then. Uh, what has been clarified for us um, for cases like this? Uh, as uh, Andrew McCutcheon said, it, uh, the court was quite careful to sort of um, point out that they, this was a narrow, uh, focused uh, response to the case that was presented to them. I'd like then to make some comments on aspects of how the court arrived here, clinical perspectives on cases like this. And then arising from this ruling, what we are wondering about for cases similar but not quite like this. And finally, arising from this ruling, what we are concerned about for our practice. So in terms of uh, what has been clarified for us for cases like this, well, first we have to sort of uh, remind ourselves what are cases like this. So for, from my perspective or our perspective, the, this patient was in a subacute phase, was ventilator dependent and had a disorder of consciousness. The physicians gauged that ventilation was outside the standard of care using multiple dimensions. The substitute decision maker insisted that the ventilator must be applied and all the usual manners of resolution were exhausted. And what was clarified for us was that the forum for resolution of this was the CCB versus the court. And therefore the question is about is the substitute decision maker functioning within the rules set out for them in contrast to what may be discussed in the court, which may be the standard of care, fiduciary duty, best interest of the patient, patient preferences, and so on. And the court set out sequential steps uh, for us to pursue in this process. So essentially, it was clarified for us that in essence, the SDM's insistence on the application of the ventilator becomes the default determinant of the course of action, and its discontinuance has been framed as a health-related purpose that requires consent. So I'd like to make some comments on some aspects of how the court arrived here uh, from our perspective as, as, uh, as critical care physicians. So we know that the uh, Canadian Medical Association, the CPSO, the U of T Joint Centre for Bioethics and others suggest that physicians or the healthcare team are not required to provide care that is not medically of benefit. So we, we needed clarity on how we would withdraw and withhold interventions that are not medically beneficial within a bioethical framework. That's where we operate, within bioethical frameworks, and that would in turn be consistent with a, within a legal framework. Mechanical uh, ventilation discontinuation requires consent in this, in this ruling because it is an action that met the definition of a health-related purpose. And they pointed out that this was a relevant test in contrast to what they really uh, referred to was the construct of medical benefit, which was our test. So our test they referred to as a, as a, as a, um, as a construct. And really the, the relevant legal test in this case seems to trump the so-called medical construct, whereas in most other situations we expect it to go in tandem, that we expect to, to meet the medical construct of medical benefit and then subsequently also meet the legal, uh, legal test of, of consent for the health-related purpose. And so the bioethical framework that we expected to operate, or we do operate in, and, and maybe has been operated by, uh, within um, by physicians for two and a half thousand years, would include autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. And they determined that withdrawal of mechanical ventilation is a treatment and therefore requires consent as per the healthcare, uh, that is the HCCA, because they really gave a number of arguments, but these I think were amongst the top four. And there were a lot of ironies that we felt in response to the arguments they used to determine whether uh, this uh, withdrawal of mechanical ventilation is a treatment. Firstly, they said it affected patient autonomy in a most fundamental way because it would affect their ongoing um, life. And I think it's ironic to many of us because it's really the preservation of that autonomy that m many critical care physicians feel strongly about when they seek not to provide medically inappropriate care. Uh, the patients must be touched in order to uh, um, uh, discontinue mechanical ventilation. And that's ironic to us because it's sort of like saying you have to touch somebody to unlock the handcuffs. Really the goal is like the first one and that is to uh, liberate people from unnecessary treatment 
And in fact, they need, they need a lot more touching to stay on mechanical ventilation than to come off. It serves as a health-related purpose, was another argument. And of course, we're concerned about the wide uh, sort of scope of definition that that included and what it means in terms of requiring consent. And finally, that it's linked to the initiation of palliative care. We've talked about this already at this meeting. So for many of us, we initiate, for all of us really, we initiate symptom control at the outset of critical care. Uh, and so really, it's not, it's not linked. Uh, so-called palliative care or symptom control is begun at the outset of a critical care phase and probably even before that. So arising from this ruling, what are we wondering about for cases similar but not quite like this? So a number of examples came up when I talked to my colleagues about, well, given this ruling, does this apply in this situation? So I think the biggest one for many of us were trials of critical care, and that's really the way many of us are thinking now when we bring someone to the intensive care unit, is really a trial of critical care, in the, sometimes in the context of end-stage disease, and that's why we frame it as such, as a trial. We know you've got a terminal illness, uh, but you have an episode of pneumonia that may or may not be reversible, and let's try this. So how does this ruling affect a situation like this? Other stable forms of a critical life support, for example, ECMO, and, and Peter was telling me a story of a, of, a, of a child who was in a stable state on ECMO, but not transplantable, and we really was, there was no bridge to any, any definitive treatment. Or even less sta uh, stable forms of critical support like CPR and cardiopulmonary bypass. The concept of continuous versus intermittent life support, not treatment like the chemotherapy example that Andrew McCutcheon brought up, um, but this can be a matter of semantics. For example, episodes of mechanical ventilation are sort of, are they synonymous with repeated antibiotic therapy for uh, pneumonia? So is that an intermittent treatment that you can withhold a component of, or is that part of the package of being on a ventilator? Intermittent hemodialysis, is that a, a, a course of dialysis or is that intermittent treatments where you can withhold the fifth uh, round of hemodialysis? And finally, some people even wondered about discharge or repatriation. We were talking about this in the last hour and whether patient refusal to be discharged from hospital or repatriated back to their own ICU uh, would require consent. So finally, arising from this ruling, what we were concerned about for our practice? Well, a few general statements first, and then I'll finish up with some questions. The terminology in the ruling had implications regarding the court's perception, and maybe others' perceptions, of the scope and objectives of critical care. They used terms like prevention of death, preserving the body, and things like that. So the, sc the scope and purpose of the Consent and Capacity Board, in contrast to the common law, or what, in the court's opinion, is relevant in approaching cases like this. Autonomy in this decision was elevated while the other elements of the bioethical framework that I uh, showed you earlier were not really mentioned in depth. Offering or proposing a treatment may result in the requirement to achieve consent not to provide it. This has the potential to lead to both an impediment and a philosophical and stylistic change and deterioration in the quality of communication we have with our patients. Part of our communication is an open, fulsome type of communication. Many of my colleagues wondered about what this meant in terms of patients and their differential treatment in Ontario versus the rest of Canada. Many of my colleagues point out that the pattern of, uh, of care, of critical care, includes trial and titration. It involves reflection and reassessment. It involves recognition that the effectiveness of treatment, goals, and the health potential of patients are functions of time. It involves a therapeutic relationship that includes trust and transparency. And so does this ruling force us into a more linear model of care that, instead of these qualities, requires an advanced contract for care? So for example, does this require a contract-like treatment plan in advance before the patient comes into the unit that will bundle the following things, a consent to treat in the first place, but a consent to a trial, the concept of a trial, consent for parallel palliative care, and consent for withdrawal of non-beneficial treatments with definitions, an advanced agreement on triggers for termination of trial of care. And the trouble is, what are the operating characteristics of such bundling? Because as we know, people can change their mind and accept one component and maybe change their mind for the remaining components. If we reach the point of requiring resolution, now it seems as though the onus is now on the physician to initiate a CCB hearing, in contrast to previously where the patient had to request a court injunction. 
So here are my questions that I uh, and my colleagues were left with. Where the court envisioned that we elicit consent for withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy, in this case mechanical ventilation, would assent suffice? So as you know, most of us achieve a relationship with our patient families and substitute decision makers. And while many of our families understand the medical inappropriateness of care, there is a small but real number of patient families who are never able to say the words, OK, stop. And in those situations, we go ahead and we say, well, this is what's going to be done. And we allow them to disagree, but we don't force them to tell us to do it. We heard yesterday that uh, the incidence of PTSD is greater in patients who have actively been involved in that decision as opposed to passively assented. Um, so uh, furthermore, if we do need consent, do we need to get a signature? Now we've heard the advice from our, our legal friends to document our conversations, but the requirement for consent is translated into the need for a, uh, to document with a signature in other medical procedures with similar stakes. The consent form uh, preoperatively is one of the main items that we look for. Question. Uh, we now need more guidance in carrying out our fiduciary duty to patients in deciding when to challenge the SDM at the CCB. So does the rationale of the SDM have to be rational? So these are some of the commonest reasons that we hear from SDMs. We're waiting for a miracle. My uncle survived mechanical ventilation coma, and he's well now or we want life at any cost. So do these reasons or do these rationales constitute a reason to challenge the substitute decision makers' uh, qualities at the CCB? Finally, we need some help with the issue of withholding. We understand that a patient cannot propose a treatment outside the medical standard of care. But because of the arguments used in this ruling that specifically relate to uh, life-preserving and especially uh, uh, things that affect autonomy with respect to ongoing life, does this ruling tell us anything with regards to SDM proposed life support? Such as, I haven't proposed CPR, but my patient families are very sophisticated. I had a very sophisticated family this weekend. They want CPR, they want mechanical ventilation, they know what they want, and they know what is life-preserving. So because of the life-preserving nature, I'm not talking about other medical therapies, but life-preserving uh, uh, therapies, uh, do we need uh, consent? So I'll stop there and uh, I'll left with a few questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Andrew. It's very clear, uh, provocative, a uh, little disturbing. Um, Erica Barron is uh, the content, not the person. Uh, Erica Barron is a partner in McCarthy Tetro. She is extensively experienced in litigation. Actually, the LinkedIn resume is pretty scary, actually. But uh, <clears throat> she's extensively experienced at all judicial levels uh, in the province and the country. And uh, she's going to talk to us about uh, some of her responses to the concerns that Andrew, as a clinician, has raised. Thank you, Erica. Let me start by saying I'm really sorry. <laughs> we wanted more from this decision than we got. Um, I want to talk a bit about some of the questions that Dr. Baker raised and then a little bit about sort of what's left. Um, if you take one thing away from what I say today, it is this. When you have a case that you think engages the Rizzoli decision, please call the CMPA, um, to the extent that you're all members of the CMPA. Um, those of you who aren't, don't call the CMPA, they won't help you. Um, but, <laughs> but, but for those of you who are members of the CMPA, um, I think a lot of doctors don't appreciate that, a lot of every doctor knows if I get served with a lawsuit, I should call the CMPA, or I hope every doctor knows that. Um, what I think some doctors don't realize is that the CMPA provides much broader advice and assistance to physicians. Um, than simply in civil litigation matters, and this is one of those circumstances. And particularly while we struggle through the scope of this decision and the implications of this decision, you will need advice from lawyers and from other um, physicians who, who we may be able to get second opinions on to help you through these complicated issues. So <clears throat> the first question that, that Dr. Baker posed was, is assent enough in these circumstances? I wish I could tell you that it was, but it's not. 
Um, if you are in a circumstance like the Rizzuli case where you are proposing to withdraw life support and the family, the substitute decision maker is objecting to that or indeed a patient, a capable patient is objecting to that and that would be a rare circumstance I think. Um, assent will not suffice now. You need consent and it has to be informed consent. It must follow the requirements of the Health Care Consent Act. Assent is what we often strove for. So often when I had a physician put in my hands for advice in, in a matter before it was at the court or the consent capacity board, it was just at the point of a dispute, the advice I would give to the doctors is sometimes it helps is what you say to the patient is we're not asking the, the patient's family member, we're not asking you to decide. We're just telling you this is what we're doing because that frees them from, from the burden of the decision that the decision has already been made by the patient's underlying condition and what's indicated by medicine. That is no longer available, so con consent is required. So then comes the question, do you need a signature? Um, so in the other half of what I do for doctors, not end-of-life disputes, but, but circumstances where doctors are being sued after the fact, um, we like if there's a consent form, but a consent form helps us not at all if there was no discussion behind that consent form. So informed consent is always about the discussion that you've had with the patient or the substitute decision maker, and the signature is just some evidence of that discussion having taken place. But it's not uncommon for people to say, yes, I signed that form, but no, they didn't properly disclose the risk to me, and we lose those cases um, at trial if we can't demonstrate that the risks were, were discussed. So far more important than a signature on a piece of paper is a, document, a careful documentation of the discussion um, that was had with the patient um, or the substitute decision maker. And probably a signature is a good practice in these circumstances. Frankly, I'd prefer a signature below your note in the file saying that the note actually describes the conversation because in, in my experience, the hospital consent forms are very generic. They simply say the risks and benefits have been disclosed without talking about what they are. The next question that was put was, does the substitute decision maker have to be rational in their decision maker? My view is the answer to that is yes, they do. It is important to remember that notwithstanding the fact that where you have an incapable person and you're relying on a substitute decision maker to decide for the patient, that your duty always is to the patient. The substitute decision maker is merely a surrogate for the patient who is making decisions on behalf of the patient. And to the extent that the substitute decision maker is not acting in accordance with the statute, they will be overruled by the Consent and Capacity Board. And so there are two things that you must consider when you're faced with a substitute decision maker who's not agreeing with what is medically recommended in the circumstances. The first question you will have to ask yourself under the statute is, was there a prior expressed applicable wish? Um, you will probably not be able to answer that question without the help from someone like me who can tell you what the case law says about that. Um, the second question, if, if the answer to the first question is no, then the second part of the question is what is in the patient's best interest? And that takes into, a whole, takes into account a whole variety of things, including the patient's values and beliefs, which of course you will probably know nothing about other than secondhand through the substitute decision maker. Um, although occasionally you'll get a power of attorney for personal care that, that talks about those things, sometimes in vague and non-helpful terms, I might add. Um, and then a whole bunch of medical type questions. Um, and figuring that out, again, it's useful to have the advice of someone like me or like Andrew who, who knows um, how those sorts of things tend to be interpreted by the Consent Capacity Board. So what does the decision mean? If you have a case like the Rizzuli case, you need consent, and if it's not forthcoming, the option is to go to the Consent Capacity Board. And you don't need to do that alone. You can do it alone, but you need not do it alone. The question is, what about beyond the, the four corners of this case? So what I would say is, we don't know yet. Um, there is a wealth of authority from other jurisdictions, including, and, and even some cases from within Canada, um, that's, that stands for the proposition that doctors cannot be compelled to act simply by the, the patient or the substitute decision maker saying, I want this particular treatment. Um, 
So the question is, does that change in the context of something that's considered life-sustaining? My view is that there are still categories of therapies, and I don't call them treatments anymore because that ends up being confusing because the term treatment is used in, in the statute in a way that's been interpreted by the Supreme Court to include the withdrawal of therapies, and so I, I've now reverted to talking about ser therapies. So my view that there, there are still categories of medical therapies which likely do not attract consent requirements. Please do not rely on any of this in making your decisions call for the individual facts of your case if you have one. Um, one category of cases that we've thought about are circumstances where the patient has recovered sufficiently that they no longer require a particular therapy. So take mechanical ventilation. You've got a patient with some degree of dementia. They've got an aspiration pneumonia. They come to the ICU. They recover from their underlying pneumonia. They're ready to be weaned and sent back to the unit. Do you need consent to take them off the mechanical ventilation in that case? They don't actually need it. It's not doing anything for them at that point. They're breathing on their own. They don't need the support of the mechanical ventilation. But in all likelihood, at some point down the road, they will need it again. Do you need consent in that case? Um, my view is that there's a good argument that it's an excluded act from the definition of treatment because there's no benefit and some harm to keeping them on the mechanical ventilation. The problem is if you've already got in your mind that you're not bringing them back for another admission to the ICU, that may change the dynamic. My view is that there is also a good argument that if you are not offering treatment, for instance, if you're saying we are not going to put, we're not going to offer mechanical ventilation, we are not offering CPR, that because there is nothing being done in that case other than the writing of an order and there is no touching of the patient involved in that case that consent is likely not required in those circumstances as well. And if there's a dispute, it would go to the court rather to the consent capacity board. That being said, it is always open to seek consent. So physicians can always take the option of, of going and asking for consent to anything. You can say, you know what, I don't think this is indicated. Um, but I'm going to go ask for the substitute decision maker's consent. But I think when you're making a decision like that, you really have to struggle with the question, why are you doing that? Why are you putting something on the table that you don't think is indicated for your patient, keeping in mind that it is always the patient to whom you owe the duty? You don't owe a duty of not having conflict with the substitute decision maker. Your duty remains with the patient. The other thing that's important we know from experiencing these cases is the importance of consensus within the unit because we know the way you folks all practice is you're on for a week and then there's someone new that comes on next week and someone new that comes on the week after that. And one of the areas that we have sometimes seen challenges with the family is where the messaging to the family is not consistent across the staff and across the residents and the fellows who are working within the units. And so that's one of the things that's really important is to ensure that where you've got cases where there's the possibility of a difference of opinion that you, with the family, that there be a consensus among the team that can be a very useful thing because it's also helpful if the family is hearing the same message. Um, and if there isn't consensus, then there isn't consensus. There won't always be consensus, but that may suggest that it's appropriate to seek consent in those circumstances where there isn't consensus. Um, so those are my thoughts. I'm sure I haven't answered any of the questions that were put. <laughs> um, that's partly because we can't. Um, but we, um, I feel happy that I am young enough in my career that I hope I will be able to see this through to uh, more clarity for your folks over the course of the next few years um, because I know this has left you all in a very um, challenging po position from, a, from the perspective of what do we do when this case presents itself. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Erica. As uh, Brian said earlier on, what we'd like to do is to open this up to the floor and please identify yourselves, even if you think you're well known, you may not be known to everybody. Now, I'm going to start the conversation by asking Erica a question. You spoke about life sustaining therapy, and those were the words that you use. And in today's world, increasingly, we're using forms of extracorporeal support, such as ECMO. If we have a child, and Andrew referred to this patient, who is on ECMO, and we know that their lungs are totally destroyed, yet the child is completely conscious, lying in a bed, playing with his dinky toy, and there is no way out of it. What happens with consent in that situation? Um, 
Yeah, thanks for asking, starting me off with an easy question. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I think, you know, the hope would be that you can get to a resolution without the need for the consent capacity board. Um, I would be reluctant to say that in the face of Rizzoli, I think that's a circumstance where you'd need consent to withdraw. I, I think it would be, I think that the consent capacity board would side with us on that. Um, but I, I don't, I, I think it's very difficult to distinguish those facts from the facts of Rizzoli. <laughs> Sorry, not the answer you wanted, I'm sure. <laughs> So much for expensive legal opinion. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> thank you, though. <clears throat> uh, please. <clears throat> uh, John Granton, University of Toronto. And uh, it's important to recognize my comments don't reflect those of the Canadian Critical Care Society. Um, a lot of comments, but a specific question. I, I honestly, in many levels, don't think that this, this differs from actually what we do at present at when it, in regards to the institution of comfort care in a patient who has an advanced <coughs> medical or surgical illness. We get consent. We routinely explain what we're about to do to patients or the, fa or, or the family, more common the family in the critical care situation. We describe that the current therapy towards improving their disease are not useful and we now embark upon a strategy which is which is solely sole purpose is on improving quality of life or comfort and we describe what we're going to do and we obtain consent for that we don't get a signature signature respectfully for lawyers they do not assure uh, understanding or that the explanation occurred they merely tell you that the patient or person was there and signed a form so I, I don't see that this and the question to you then is how does this materially differ from what we currently do, except when there's a disagreement. And maybe, Andrew, initially, do you get consent or do you get assent in your mind? Well, I, I think the answer is you're, you are obliged to, to get consent. Um, in terms of how is it material, materially different uh, from what you're doing right now, if you're writing good notes, uh, it, it's not. Um, it, it never hurts to have that signed consent form in the file, what that prevents is two years from now, the, the patient or the substitute decision maker standing up and saying, uh, no, I, we, that discussion never, never took place. That note is a fraud. Um, so that's the protection that the, the signature gets you. Um, and it really is, as you say, for lawyers and not necessarily for, for your own process, but it's a, a good practice to implement uh, if you're able to do it. Uh, but as Eric has said to you, I think the key is writing a good note. So we discuss the risks and benefits of the, of the uh, treatment, including X, Y, and Z, discuss the likely outcomes, uh, and all of that is written up in a, a nice note in the chart. Andrew McCutcheon, does the uh, patient for consent to be valid need to know that they had a possibility of saying no? Because what John said is, pretty, John Granton said it's pretty common, but uh, they're not actually asked, do you agree? And if you don't agree, it, in many cases, you're sort of told and you accept it because they trust you. So, you're, I mean, if, if that's your question, I think the answer is yes, you, you must get consent and you must comply with the, the requirements in the Act in those circumstances where, where consent is required. And it's not enough to say this is what uh, we're going to do and, and not ask for, for permission. Uh, you must identify the substitute decision maker and you must obtain their consent. And Baker. So just to respond um, to that, I mean, I think the big difference from what I've heard from um, in, in the majority of cases um, is the situation where we find ourselves in a, say, 15%, just non-zero number, where we are um, achieving assent only, like uh, what Brian is describing, where we don't uh, force the patient to one, understand that they have the option of, of saying we want to stay on the ventilator, or two, force the patient, family, substitute decision maker to say, okay, do this. We say to the family, this is what we think should happen, and this is what we're going to do, and they don't object. And we recognize in a certain percentage of our families, we can't bring them all to say, okay, we want you to take our person off the ventilator. And so what I'm hearing, and what I didn't really hear Erica say, she said that assent was not sufficient in cases where the SDM objects. In the majority of cases, our families agree with us, or at least they don't disagree. So what I really want to know from Erica is, is assent still okay when the SDM is not appearing to be 
to, to object? Or do we still need to get the sort of consent that Brian is talking about, where the, the STM fully understands their options? And I, I think that is what could change our practice, John. Because right now, I bet you that 15% of the time, or, or some number, we are achieving assent only. And what I'd like to know is whether I'm going to be achieving consent now in every case of withdrawal of mechanical ventilation. Erica? So essentially, you've asked the daughter in California question. Um, I don't know if you folks have heard of the daughter in California, but essentially what you're, so the, the question is, what are you trying to achieve? If you are trying to achieve the legal protection under the statute um, of not getting sued for acting without consent, then you need consent. If, uh, in all circumstances, because then you've got it documented, clear, you've got it from the proper substitute decision maker, and the daughter from California who shows up and says, my mother shouldn't have consented to you taking my dad off life support, the answer is going to be too bad. That was, that was done in accordance with the statute, and you're legally protected. If, on the other hand, is what you're trying to achieve is, you know, 95% of the time, or even probably 99% of the time, um, not a bad outcome. Assent is probably protection enough, but it's probably not legally correct. Um, so it, it really depends on what you're looking for. Is practical or 100% or legal? If you're looking for 100% legal, you need consent, and for consent to be effective under the statute, it must be informed, and I, I agree with Andrew McCutcheon, that that means that one of the th things that has to be put to them is they have the right to say, no, I don't agree with that. Erica, if you were advising a hospital institution as opposed to an individual doctor. I never do that. I know, but if you were, <laughs> <laughs> if they, you know, different league, if you're, if, if you're, would they, uh, would they err on the side of a, a much more stringent, um, would you advise a sort of a uniform stringency or would you advise sort of latitude? That's rhetorical. <laughs> Um, I think it would depend on the hospital based on, so every hospital has sort of varying levels of stringency that, it, that they apply. And so um, at the end of the day, physicians 90, 95% of the time are independent contractors. And so whatever the hospital's policy said, you should follow them because you'll get in trouble with the hospital if you don't follow your own hospital's policies. But at the end of the day, you're responsible for your own conduct as a physician. And, I, and, and hospitals are often careful to say, we're not going to tell doctors what they must do, save for sort of the bare minimum. But I expect we will see some hospitals requiring actual consents in these circumstances, signed consents. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Hi, uh, James Downer from Toronto. And following on John's example, I'll say that my comments don't necessarily represent my opinions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would, uh, just to make the, the question brief, a lot of us obviously concerned about the implications of this decision. Uh, I would like to get your opinions on a couple of the so-called nuclear options in this case. Um, <laughs> one of them is uh, the potential of going to law review and having the law, or, or another legal or parajudicial means to have the law changed, narrowed, etc. The second option would be um, if we really do need to start getting consent for a lot of these borderline cases, um, the potential for us to start referring literally all of them to the Consent and Capacity Board and finding out exactly what the capacity of the Capacity Board is. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take that? Yeah. Sure. So um, the law review option is a, a, an excellent idea. Um, assuming that you're able to get consensus as a profession, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the, the appropriate vehicle for that is if you go through the, uh, the OMA or the, the CMA. Um, but um, that's an excellent idea if, if this is something that you feel strongly about lobbying the government uh, to have the law changed. Uh, and the second, your second nuclear option is a, a, a CCB hearing. And um, certainly, if, if you're put in a position... Or more accurately, a lot of CCB here. Yeah. It or would be basically a, a CCB outbreak. You just need the yes. right one. <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly, if you're put in a position uh, where, where you feel like you're being uh, asked to treat contrary to your professional obligations, uh, I, I would recommend that you go off to the CCB. Uh, they generally do do uh, a, a good job uh, at the board. Um, they've been, I think, supportive of doctors, by and large, uh, as, as these things go. Um, there will be a delay involved uh, if 
it proceeds to a second step, uh, like an appeal. Uh, so it's not just the capacity of the CCB, but also, uh, of course, the courts uh, to be able to resolve these, um, resolve these things. But have the CCB not been directed how to act? <clears throat> I mean, don't the concerns you've raised, aren't they at the door of the CCB or anybody else? In terms of the... Uh, In terms of what constitutes treatment and the need for consent. Certainly, and, and they've been raised, uh, those issues have certainly been raised tangentially uh, before the Consent and Capacity Board. Um, but really, it's, uh, it's the Rizzuli decision that governs now. And Next. let me just say on the law review um, point that the government of Ontario had standing to seek intervention, any, any provincial government did. Um, the Consent and Capacity Board also was an intervener as of right and could have participated at the Supreme Court, and neither did. Um, I think that gives you a sense of what sort of hot potato the government sees this issue as. So while it's, a, in theory, the government with the stroke of a pen can regulate non-beneficial treatments to not be treatments, or Alberta has a futile treatment isn't treatment under their statute, whatever futile means, because that's another interesting debate we could have for a long time. Um, I think the likelihood of the government touching that hot potato is pretty small. Okay, next question, please. Uh, hi, Francois Carrier from Montreal. I have two questions, actually. The first one is, we don't have common law in Quebec, so uh, to which extent does this apply uh, in our <laughs> province? And the second one is, how do you see um, the DNR orders? Uh, we often have uh, situations where all the doctors think that it's in, inappropriate to, uh, to proceed to resuscitation, and the family really wants to have resuscitation. And many of my colleagues, non-intensivists, are reluctant to not prescribe uh, DNR or, or stage two resuscitation, whatsoever it's called. So um, how do you see that? Because if I understood you well, um, we have the right not to proceed with resuscitation if everybody thinks, everybody meaning the, 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 the health professionals, think that it's in, inappropriate even though the family wants to have it. So I'll start by saying I am not called in Quebec. I know nothing about the civil code. Um, our colleagues in Montreal at our Montreal office, I'm sure, have some fantastic insights on this, um, but I don't know um, what the rule is. My understanding is that the law is not significantly different for the consent sort of scheme in Quebec than it is in Ontario or in, at common law, um, based on conversations I've had with my colleagues in Montreal. Um, <clears throat> my view in Ontario, um, and I think under the common law as well, is and is that a DNR order is not the doing of anything <laughs> other than the writing of a note. Um, and in circumstances where the standard of care says you should not be offering a DNR, that you, sh you should not be offering CPR, um, that the writing of a DNR order can be argued to not be a treatment under the, under the Health Care Consent Act, not caught by the Rizzoli statute requiring consent. Um, but I think that remains to be seen, and I think we will we'll have an answer to that question in the not-too-distant future in Ontario in any event, I expect. Okay, can you just explain briefly why we'll have that answer? Um, there some are some know. outstanding pieces of civil litigation, including one that's sort of widely reported about uh, a case where uh, no CPR order was written on a chart, and there's a lawsuit arising from the CPR was not administered, and there's a lawsuit by the daughter against the physicians for making that order and not carrying out CPR, notwithstanding that she wanted it done. Peter. Sorry, Erica, could you just clarify for us, is that if we agree as a medical team that CPR should not be offered, you made two comments. You said, well, should you be even thinking about a proposed treatment that you're not going to deliver? And that's what I think you said, number one. And if you're not going to offer it, I've just heard you say, if I heard correctly, that you don't really need to get consent, and that may need to be clarified in the future. Our practice is usually to inform a family. Yes, you must inform the family. I think that, uh, I think that um, you are asking for trouble if you, if you don't at least make an attempt. It's not always possible, right? So sometimes you have emergent circumstances where the general consensus is that CPR is non-appropriate treatment option and something happens acutely um, and there, is, there simply isn't time. Um, but absent sort of 
exigencies like that, um, I think that there is a duty of communication, but that's as far as the duty goes in my view. But, but I, I think time will tell. And so, you know, as I said, you can always take the position that consent is required. Um, the problem is, is what's likely going to happen is you're going to need to perform it before you get a decision on it and how comfortable are you with breaking the octogenarian's ribs and, and performing futile CPR in the meantime. There may be situations where you can predict that the child in my situation, yes. will require CPR within the next week, and you decide that that's an inappropriate step. We would inform if you do seek consent, there will be or there may be an objection. Correct. And so that can lead to quite a um, fiery situation. Right, because if once you once you ask for consent, you've essentially once you say will you consent, you've essentially suggested that you're willing to do it, and it's up to them to decide. Um, and so, yes, I agree. Once you put it on the table and phrase it in that way, um, you've converted it into something where if they say, well, I don't consent, then you put yourself in a little bit of a tough situation. So you say to families, I'll ask you for consent, provided you'll say no. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, I'm sure that conversation would go well. Yeah. <laughs> That's very important, actually. Some of the hospitals have, um, have uh, hospital policies where uh, by, uh, if uh, they do, certainly don't uh, uh, require doctors to utilize uh, uh, futile care, futile in the eyes of the doctors, that is, uh, but they absolutely require that the family, that decision, if it's made, be communicated to the family. So you communicate the decision, but don't offer it as a potential issue for consent. And it, but it raises sort of an interesting question because there are about a thousand other treatments that you don't have that conversation with the family about because they don't even enter into the discussion. Uh, and so, you know, I, I can't think of a good example right now, but, you know, you don't have a conversation about dialysis when the patient's not yet in renal failure, but, you know, when they get there, then probably you do have a conversation about dialysis, even if you're not offering it. But then what about all of the other sort of things that are out there that the family doesn't know yeah. about? Do you I guess communicate? The, yeah. It's impossible to have that level of communication about every possible treatment option out there in the world. The issues that are immediately life-sustaining yeah. in the face of a cardiac arrest are the, are the hot-button ones. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Which is CPR, mechanical ventilation, or in some centers, ECMO. Yeah. Uh, increasingly so. Yeah, and dialysis is definitely is uh, sort is of a subacute. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to comment, Andrew? No. Nope. Great. <laughs> we'll have an Andrew one or two issue here. Uh, next question, Hi, please. Uh, John Marshall, St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. So it seems to me, first of all, that there's a problem with terminology here, uh, in that we're using the word treatment very, very loosely. I mean, to me, what we're talking about is support, and support is something that you do to avert death. Uh, but it does nothing to change the natural history of disease. Treatment should change the natural history of disease. And I'm wondering if the standard that we should be applying to support uh, is the same standard we should be applying to treatment. Uh, treatment I have no trouble with. Second, I, so I'd interest, be interested in your thoughts on that. The second is, I have a question, and that is, uh, is it rational to believe in miracles? In other words, if we are, have a discussion uh, and the miracle option is brought up, is that the time to actually start be thinking about uh, legal advice and getting a consent and capacity board because you're not sure that the <clears throat> uh, best interests are of the patient are being uh, kept John, we got some spiritual guidance for you on the second question. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> let me see it. But I need it to Brian. I need it a lot. <laughs> on the first question, uh, are you allowed to just not use the term treatment or differentiate? It's, it's tricky, right, because treatment has a meaning under the statute. That's why I've sort of reverted to therapies. It doesn't really help the problem. And, and the thing is, is like, do, do you call mechanical ventilation where someone's got a pneumonia that you're treating with antibiotics? Support. Is that a treatment or support? support. Right. Support. And so really, I mean, at the end of the day, we're distinguish, distinguishing in a way between supports that will get you through an illness and, and the, same, the exact same thing that will not get you through an underlying illness. Um, that distinction the Supreme Court certainly did not grasp, and so we're sort of left with the, the definition of treatment that they've gleaned from the statute. Andrew Baker. Well, I, I think John's second question is very important because I think that um, what we're sort of really witnessing here is, is a sort of a legal construct, and we've, we've really set aside the medical construct and, uh, uh, that has really survived for two and a half thousand years. Um, in favor of, of a legal construct which has been around for about 10 or, or 16 years called the Health Care and Consent Act. 
And uh, so it's, it's very common what John says, um, and it, it may not be miracles, but it may be somebody uh, sort of assessing, we, you know, we've heard all sorts of experts here on outcomes of mechanical ventilation, and then you get a, an uncomplicated family who has had an uncle who survived, or newspaper and article. essentially summarizes the case for you and says, well, you know, I believe in miracles, or I believe this patient is going to get better. And so I would really like uh, to understand um, the answer to John's question uh, because it is exceptionally common to hear what amounts to a, a firm fixed belief in a family. Uh, so when people are not being rational by yep. our best measure. So let me answer that. There, there are, miracles are relevant at two stages uh, before the Consent and Capacity Board. <laughs> Uh, the first is, there's a long line of decisions that say decisions should not be made on, on, uh, on hope. So where there's overwhelming medical evidence and the patient says, well, we think a miracle, or the substitute decision maker says, we think a miracle will occur, the board says that's not a reason for us to carry on uh, with this futile, uh, harmful treatment. Uh, but it also comes into the analysis at a, a second stage. So if the patient, uh, him or herself, held strong religious beliefs. Uh, and there are religions uh, that believe that it's a sin uh, to terminate life, uh, to, that you must do everything to preserve life at all costs. Um, that is a value and belief that enters into the best interest uh, analysis. And I'm aware of at least one case before the board, and this, this is uncommon, but there is one case uh, where those religious beliefs uh, trumped uh, the, all of the medical evidence uh, in the case. But to answer the exact question that was asked, if the word miracle comes up in the conversation, yes, that's the time to call the CMPA. <laughs> because you'll need one. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. Hello, I'm Tracy Bailey. I'm a health law lawyer practicing in Alberta. Thank you to all of you for an excellent presentation, very clear description of the case and the issues. Um, I'm so sorry for the decision. I know it's not because of excellent efforts on, on your behalf. Um, I've got a couple of questions, and one goes to what I read as a kind of a gap, and I'm wondering if this, you think the majority of the Supreme Court of Canada understood this. So they basically, I think, have some comfort in the conclusion they reached because they think the board can substitute its decision in all cases. But what about cases where a person has a clear prior express wish? That's applicable. So I see that as that's a case where, as I read it, but you're the experts in Ontario, uh, the board can't actually substitute a decision in those cases. And so you could be left with a case where um, a person that's now incompetent but left a clear prior express wish can demand treatment that a competent patient could not. So I'm wondering if I'm understanding that correctly and if you think the Supreme Court of Canada got that as they kind of reached their decision, which they tried very hard to restrict because they were afraid of the implications it would have. My second question is, in the discussion around definitions, did they consider the word administration? because Section 10, as you guys know well, says you need consent for administration of treatment. And even the definition of plan of treatment, it talks about administration of treatment or a plan of treatment, and then goes on to say, and the plan may also include stuff about withholding withdrawal, but nothing said about administration in that context. And so I'm wondering, like the way I read it, you don't need consent for withholding withdrawal, but that's clearly not the way the court interpreted it. I'm just wondering, did they get into that as you had your arguments, or as you presented your arguments, whoops, to them? I'll, I'll take the first half and you can take the second one. Great. So, um, Thank you. I've forgotten what the first one is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you take the second half, Andrew. Oh, yeah. So, um, so I think there's a few things about the, the prior expressed applicable wish. Um, there is some language in the decision that suggests to us that the Supreme Court thinks that it will be hard to imagine a prior express applicable wish to receive something that's contrary to the standard of care. There's some language in there that, that almost implies that. Um, and it is interesting because rarely is there found to have been a prior express applicable wish. Um, there's another provision under the statute as well, the Supreme Court I don't think actually makes reference to that allows um, the family member or I believe the physician to apply to depart from a prior express wish. Now there's some problems with the language of that which is um, it says something like where the expected outcomes are, are materially different than at the time the, the wish was expressed. Um, 
which is really directed at psychiatric treatment. I mean, that's what this statute was built to deal with psychiatric patients primarily. That's, that was the whole impetus behind the statute. And, and it's meant to address sort of the, the rapid evolution we've seen in antipsychotic medications where there were these terrible side effects for a long time and we're, we're a lot better about those side effects are a lot less bad than they used to be. And it was, that section was really meant to deal with that. But I think it would be an interesting argument to say essentially their wish was premised on a notion that this treatment or therapy would do something that it's not actually capable of achieving. And so the withdrawal of the treatment actually is better than what they thought continuation of the treatment would be. That would be sort of the way you'd pitch the argument to the board. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out in the actual jurisprudence before the board as we go forward with some of these cases. Um, but it does sort of raise the interesting question. If you've got a capable person sitting there saying, I want this, I want that, I want the other thing. Um, the board has no jurisdiction in those circumstances, and so um, we may start to see some of those cases percolate through. Not, I, I doubt life support because I, I can't imagine a circumstance where you have a fully competent, capable patient it's possible. asking for life support where you wouldn't be willing to offer it because obviously they're capable and have a life that's, that's worth living and, and engage, are engaged in the world. Rare circumstances, uh, ECMO, a conscious patient with no prognosis, but very rare, yeah. Yeah. Andrew McCutcheon? Right, so the, I think the second part of the question was uh, the language regarding an administration of a treatment in the Healthcare Consent Act. And certainly before Rizzuli, uh, I read the act the same way that you did, uh, that it's only you know, applying in, in, in those circumstances where there's a, a, a treatment being proposed. Um, uh, after Rizzoli, I'm not sure that the court uh, paid much attention to that in the decision. It, it really, uh, at least my reading of it, is a, a purpose of interpretation of the, st of the statute, and I, I think that's sort of glossed over. Um, the second part that you brought up is the language regarding a plan of treatment, which can, of course, provide for the withholding or, or withdrawal of a treatment. And the, the court um, doesn't give us a lot of guidance on that issue either, uh, although there are some sort of throwaway comments about a plan of treatment being flexible and, and maybe being able to change uh, in, in some circumstances, although we're not going to tell you uh, what those circumstances might be. Um, so that, um, that's sort of my interpretation of those uh, two sections of the Act. Great. Okay. Thank you. Next question, please. <clears throat> Clive. Clive Davis Hamilton. Um, uh, it seems to me that the attack that we're taking on this problem is is futile, but, uh, in large part because I don't think a politician or a judge is going to stand up and go against the wishes of the public when they don't know what the public wishes are. I believe what we have to do is take a forum such as a newspaper once a week, once a month, present all these cases that every hospital in Ontario and probably across North America has examples of that are almost as, as bad as this, and, and get the public to know the details and vote on it, and, and give a plebiscite to the politicians and the judges to give them some clue that the public don't want this situation to continue indefinitely because we can't afford it. Our health care system is broke and we can't afford to deliver care that is futile when we've got other people that can't access it because they're full of futile cases. I guess there's a couple of things in that. <clears throat> One is the sort of death panel wish that was a major Republican Party uh, attack on the Affordable Care Act. And then the other <clears throat> issue is, are we doing this <clears throat> as an issue of resource control? Or are we doing this because it truly is in the best interest of the individual patient? Andrew? Well, I, th I think I heard the uh, speaker sort of refer to justice at the end of his, his uh, comments. But I don't think it was all about resources. I think it was about infor informing, we've learned a lot at this conference about the medium and long-term outcomes from critical illness, and that's where people don't have disorders of consciousness. Um, combining that with disorders of consciousness, um, if the public were to see what, uh, in what treatments were required, um, 
maybe that is the right approach, and, and maybe the politicians won't touch it, but uh, we need better public awareness. Is there a legal uh, opinion on going to the press? I, I think that, you know, I obviously read a fair amount of media after the decision came out, including the comments, and if judging by the comments, um, the public's view on this is pretty clear. Um, whether what's interesting is it's you know it's all fine and good when it's not your dad that you're talking about and then when it's your dad you feel differently about it right and so so I think that's the dilemma and I think um, I do think that at some point the rubber will hit the road for the number of cases that the consent and capacity board is is hearing that the the government will see at a certain point that that there needs to be something done um, on a resource allocation issue from a resource allocation issue perspective. Um, but for now, that cannot play a role in the physician's decision making about individual cases. It, it simply can't. Fair enough. Next question, please. Sam Mark Schammer from Edmonton. Great discussion. <laughs> I think you're right. The future will tell us. I, I'm just trying, as, as somebody out, out of Ontario, trying to understand the process. Uh, so I have a couple of questions regarding that. Did the physicians involved in the case uh, call on CCB early or late? Uh, if Not they... yet. Not at all. Okay, so then that's the next question, is what were they trying to achieve by not engaging CCB? Uh, and the last question is, if they would have engaged CCB and CCB would have sided with the physicians, would we be in this mess? I just want to say that I, I think, I, I don't think the physicians uh, I think what the physicians were trying to achieve is clarification uh, for all of us. Uh, and for that, they really need to be congratulated um, you know, and thanked for all of us. Because I, I think the question is, what is the correct forum uh, to discuss this? Which begs the question, what is the question? And if the question is, is this a matter of consent and is the substitute decision maker acting within the um, guidelines of being a substitute decision maker? Or is this a question of medical appropriateness, standards of care, fiduciary duty, and so on, which typically is heard in the courts? And so I think that there was lack of distinct lack of clarity because many of our national and provincial organizations were saying we didn't need to offer this care, uh, but it was unclear. Um, so, so I think so. The physicians didn't win or lose, or want to do one thing or another. Just, just sought to to get clarity, and. Um, uh, so that's that's the first point. Um, so I think the um, and what was your second question around? If, if the consent and capacity review board had in fact found uh, in favour of the physicians, would we have had a need to have concern? Would we be where we are? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of concern. So, so the challenge is that we have. There are a number of these cases that have gone before the consent and capacity board, typically in circumstances where. Um, the patient is on life support um, and not in circumstances where they're not on life support, but that <coughs> may become an issue in the future. Um, this, but we had routinely argued on appeals from those cases that, that the question of whether someone stays on life support is not truly something that attracts a question of consent, that, that you only get to the question of consent, the way it's phrased by one of the great British cases that consent is merely a key that unlocks a door, but we were saying there is no door here to unlock. This, this treatment option is not on the table, so whether you have a key for it or not, there's no door. Um, and so you need both. You need both a physician willing to offer the treatment and a patient or a <coughs> substitute decision maker on behalf of the patient consenting to the treatment that's on offer. And so the position that, that had be, sort of been coming up over and over again is who decides whether a treatment is on the table or not? Is that a physician only decision? Um, or can a patient or a family member say, you must offer this treatment? And what the Supreme Court has said is, once the person's on the treatment, they get to keep it until you get consent to take it away. Um, but if they're not yet on the treatment, then who knows whether you need consent or you don't need consent. And I get that for doctors, that is not the way you think about things. You treat withholdings and withdrawal exactly the same. What matters is the underlying condition of the patient and whether that treatment is indicated or not. But that's not the world we're in anymore in Ontario anyway. Once someone's on the treatment, you're stuck with it until you get consent from the family member or the board. Um, and the question of whether they go on the treatment in the first 
place is a bit of a question mark at this point as to whether you need consent for that or not, and we will, time will tell. But that's really what we were looking for. And, and what one of the things the court said was, well, these matters have been determined by the consent capacity board in the past, so that doesn't seem like such a bad option to us. I, that, that was one of the rationales for doing it. So absolutely, could we have taken this to the consent and capacity board? Yes, but that presumes away the question about whether consent is required. By the time you're going to the consent and capacity board, what you are asking about then is the question of whether consent should or shouldn't be pr provided to a particular treatment, not the question of whether the treatment should even be on the table at all. And Peter Cox is our Associate Chief of Critical Care and Head of Pediatric uh, Critical Care in the Hospital for Sick Children. And uh, Peter has a lot of experience with Consent and Capacity Review Board, and you might uh, give us some perspective from that. A lot means two. <laughs> It's On two lot. occasions That's I've been to the Consent and Capacity Board, and uh, the first was a, a young guy who was in status epilepticus, uncontrolled, ended up unconscious, and had failed numerous extubations. And the, the issue was to extubate him, and if he failed, to not reintubate him, versus the parental request to do a tracheostomy. And I did take this to the Consent and Capacity Board, and in, in fact, there are a couple of comments. I found it very useful having those discussions with them up front. They were very thorough in what they did and ended up um, actually supporting the position that I took. Um, it does take time. It doesn't happen overnight, which gets to the statement that Erica made earlier on. <clears throat> so that was good because it actually was, they found with me. There was another case not dissimilar from the first patient and I took this to the Consent and Capacity Board, and in fact, after long discussion with them, they advised me that it wouldn't gain any traction with them, and so there was no value in pursuing the case. So that's been the experience that I've had. Next question, please. <clears throat> Mazen Tuma, I'm an ICU fellow at St. Michael Hospital. So my question regarding, uh, based on this decision, uh, that should, should we now stress more on consenting patients to get on the mechanical ventilation? I mean, for intubation, that do we need like to, to have a real consent from the family that th this is what's going to be? So you, that will be easier uh, later on. I mean, maybe some family, they don't want to be on the mechanical ventilation to start with. Um, does that affect our practice of intubation, pa intubating patient? Because most of them are done on like emergency basis. Well, I think you bring up a very, very good point, and that is to what extent is the initiation of mechanical ventilation, a fully informed consent for the initiation of mechanical ventilation? And uh, I suppose much of the time we initiate mechanical ventilation um, in the context of a urgent or emergency sort of situation. But I, I suppose we do hope that uh, many of our, uh, in, in some of our clinics, like our cystic fibrosis clinic and so on, uh, and, and other chronic disease clinics, uh, the physicians there are sort of having that advanced discussion and having a more informed type of consent around the initiation. So, so I think that practice is changing. I think what my concern is when I've heard this discussion this afternoon is that there will be some reluctance on behalf of some physicians to um, initiate trials of critical care in situations where there is uh, you know, a terminal illness and where we might be convinced you know, prior to this to sort of have that trial, whether in the back of our head we're going to be concerned that once the treatment is initiated, we're stuck with it, to quote Erica here. Um, and I'm wondering what uh, sort of uh, chill that's going to put and, and how that's going to change our practice. Uh, that worries me because I, I was sort of imagining when Erica was speaking that, you know, fantasizing about a situation where I would be begging the doctor to say, look, I promise, I promise I will sort of agree to uh, just give me a trial of critical care because of that concern. Next question. Let me just add, um, there's no point trading off one piece of litigation for another. So there's no point in, 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 in not putting someone on mechanical ventilation because you think you might not get them off and get sued for that. You still have to call me anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> heads, heads you win, tails you win. Yes. <clears throat> Please. 
Thank you very much to all of you. I'm Valerie Schultz. From, I practice palliative care in the ICU in London, Ontario. Um, my question goes to our multicultural uh, society that we have and w um, what I find in having these conversations that there's a group of people that have um, very strong committed faith-based practices or cultural beliefs that so does the family member who's unwell have the same same cohort of which they will actually tell us, you know, I can agree with you, but I can't ask for that treatment, right? So they can assent, but they can't consent. Because if they do that, they have then turned their back on their family member and their and their community of support. So where where does this fit in? Yeah, so that's a, a, a good question. In the Healthcare Consent Act, there is a hierarchy uh, as to who is permitted to be a, a substitute decision maker. And one of the criteria is whether the person is available. So a family member has the right to say, I can't make this decision. Uh, turn to the next person in the hierarchy and, and get consent. And um, in a circumstance like that, you might explore that with the substitute decision maker and just say, are you they're prepared? They're from the same community. Like the, the community literally surrounds them. Just, you can have 30 people in there, you know. Sure. Yeah. It's a collective decision. So <clears throat> yeah, yeah, really. And it's very strong and it's very supportive and it's very well-meaning. I mean, it's not. So you're, just to clarify then, so you're not talking about a circumstance where there's uh, a family member saying, I'm not comfortable, I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not comfortable making the decision. You're saying there's friends and family all in the room, full, and, and everybody is, is being given a it. decision. And lovely, too, lovely, wonderful, you know. So, so in a case like that, assuming that nobody is willing to step aside, and, and ultimately, I should add, in, in extreme cases, if there's, if there's no other substitute decision maker available, uh, you are uh, permitted to seek consent from the public guardian and trustee. But if they're not willing to step aside, I think in a, a case like that, the only thing you can do is go off to the consent and capacity board. It's so, you know, it, it ruins relationships and trust. Yeah. It undermines these <coughs> things. And Can't you take the point of view that if you've got eight people <coughs> taking a collective, uh, you know, perspective, you, as long as all eight agree, what's the problem? Well, I, I think it depends who the eight people are. So the, if the eight I mean eight qualified people, right? But they won't sort of, they won't leave it up to the decision of one person. It's not a cultural norm. Right. And there's nothing that says a person who's at the top of the hierarchy can't turn to other family members uh, for guidance in making the decision. But ultimately, it is that person's decision. And, you know, I, I hear what you're saying about the damage that the sort of adversarial process of a board uh, proceeding can do to the relationship with the family. A, a lot of that depends on how you handle that. Uh, I have seen doctors who go to family members and say, um, this isn't about sort of winning and losing and us saying that, that you're doing this wrong, but uh, we have a disagreement and we need some guidance from, from somebody else. Uh, the trouble is that it's not really it's a, not disagreement. a disagreement. It's uh, not I a think disagreement. That, um, it's a way of working through situations. There are so many cases, and I totally agree with this uh, speaker, that uh, so many cases where the family knows uh, but just cannot say stop therapy. It's a, either against their culture, religion, or just they're unable to do it. And um, I can't tell you how common that is, and the answer for us has always been assent. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that, you know, sometimes you can take a calculated risk there, right? So, so, so you know, it's what I'm, like the, what I'm saying is in that case, you discontinue. What is the likelihood of there being any negative implications from that? It's, you know, the cases where there will be negative implications are the ones where you've got a family saying, absolutely not, you shall not take him off life support. Yeah, Those are consent and capacity board cases because you're already, that relationship is already broken by that point in my experience. Um, it's, but in the cases of assent, it's the question of what, what level of calculated risk are you running by, by discontinuing treatment in those circumstances? Okay, um, I'd like to, on behalf of uh, myself and, uh, yes? We're, I, Just okay. a very quick question. Very quick, please. Uh, so I heard something very disturbing. Joe Pagliarello from Ottawa. I'm an intensive care physician and uh, trauma surgeon. Um, I heard something very disturbing from Gord Rubenfeld yesterday who thought that this meant that we couldn't stop resuscitation 
in an emergency situation. So I'm a trauma surgeon, I have a gunshot wound to the chest, I'm doing my best to keep this guy alive, but at some point after half an hour of CPR, this guy is not going to survive, I have to stop CPR. Uh, does this fit, does this, does this decision influence that in any way under an emergency situation where I'm up against it? <laughs> you, you, you suggested no earlier because it was unstable. Well, I think there's a couple of things that I would say in defending that case when you got sued because you do have to stop eventually, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. I think any court will see it as ridiculous that it's sort of unsustainable to, because like at a certain point it's just not possible to continue. Um, b because it's the difference between human versus mechanical intervention. Um, that being said, um, it is a ceasing of touching. And so if we're gonna go back to the sort of the battery analysis of the Supreme Court, you just stop laying your hands on the patient all of a sudden, and there isn't any touching involved in doing that. It's silly because you can also turn off <coughs> mechanical ventilation by pushing a button and not touching the patient. Exactly. The Supreme Court, though, seems to have thought it important that there is a physical act of extubating the patient, um, which involves the touching of the patient. And so that's what I'd go back to in defending the case. I think that, I, I don't think that that is a reasonable interpretation that will be put on the decision by subsequent courts in looking at these cases. But time will tell. Okay. <clears throat> so perhaps some of the uh, most important uh, issues here are clarification of assent and consent, uh, the issue of withholding versus withdrawing and what you put on the table versus what you offer for consent. Uh, on behalf of Peter Cox and myself, uh, we would like to say a, a couple of things. Uh, First of all, we're uh, extremely confident uh, in the care provided in this country, in critical care. It's an extremely high level by immensely diligent and caring nurses and doctors. And we think that the, uh, the, our hearts go out and our minds to our colleagues in Sunnybrook and to the patients and their families who are involved in these difficult uh, situations. Uh, for this afternoon, we're immensely grateful to uh, very, very savvy, senior and able uh, respondents to our questions who have given freely of their time. We're immensely grateful to you for doing this. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.